because meaning looks to me like it's an actual phenomenon. It does say that you're, you're positioned properly between chaos and order, something like that. It's a real. So, well, so we'll see. We're going to develop that argument because if, if it's real, you want to know that because it gives you something to stand on. You know, maybe it's as real as pain, but it's not pain, it's something positive. And you need something positive that you can rely on. All right, so we're concentrating now on the unpredicted outcome, or the undesired outcome, because we said, well, that's like a portal, right? It, it's a portal through which doubt can pour, and it's the thing that makes the irrelevant relevant again. And so that's why I use this little diagram. It's like, oh, oh, that's a, that's a fear face, roughly speaking. And I put all those stripes on it to indicate that it's not just fear, it's preparation for all sorts of different for all sorts of different perceptions and all sorts of different motivational states. So imagine what happens when something knocks you back on your heels. It's like not only does your body prepare, but simultaneously with all that preparation, all sorts of fantasies are generated. Like and what they are is all sorts of alternative worlds. Well, why did this happen? You go back into your past and you say, well, here's one route, well, here's another route, here's another route, here's another route, here's another route. Like, I don't know what I did wrong, I don't know what anybody did wrong, but there's something back there that someone did wrong. And it can take people years to sort that out. And so those fantasies are all generated. And then the same thing happens with the future. It's like, well, what does this mean? Well, it could mean this, it could mean that, it could mean I'm getting divorced, it could mean I'm losing my house, it could mean I'll never talk to my kids again, it could mean that my career is going to collapse. Right? Or maybe I'll get, be able to get out of this stupid job that I've always hated and something better will happen. All at the same time. So that's, that's the response to anomaly. And the reason you respond that way is because you're no longer where you thought you were. Okay, so there's a simple way of looking at it. So what, what does an unpredicted or anomalous event mean? And I think this is... This is maybe the most important thing, the most important theme of the entire class might be what does an unpredicted or undesired outcome mean? The only thing that would be equally important is what should you do about it? But we'll start with what it means. And the answer is, well, you don't know what it means. It could mean anything. And that's a strange category, right? The, the category of anomalous events contains indefinite possibility. So what the hell do you do about that? Well, you prepare to do a variety of things. You can simplify it and say, well, it's half threat because something bad might happen, and it's half promise because something good might happen. Okay, so that's a good way of thinking about it. It's a portal. All of a sudden, instead of the thing being irrelevant, the thing is ambivalent. It contains some slice of all possible meanings, positive and negative. Okay, so you're trying to sort that out. That's partly why it's so stressful, too. And anger is a good response to that because anger is partly a... It's partly an advanced emotion, because it's got a positive emotion element, which is why anger can be righteous, you know. But it's got a negative element too. It's negative emotion and positive emotion at the same thing, same time. So it's like the canonical stress emotion. So, but it's very hard on people, anger. It's, it's very psychophysiologically demanding. So, I started with that model and then I developed it into this model, which I like better. So, you're moving from, you haven't seen this because it's not in the book. You're moving from point A to point B, and you're using your actions, your known actions, to get there. Okay, and what happens? You, f you run into an anomaly, and it's like a hole. It's a hole through the map. It's like a hole is burned in it, or something like that. And the map's no longer relevant. And so what happens? Well, your positive emotion systems are activated, or disinhibited. That's a better way of thinking about it. And your negative emotion systems are disinhibited, and what might those be? Well, in positive emotion you have hope and interest and exhilaration and curiosity and confidence, and in the negative emotional space you have anxiety and fear and hurt and anger and guilt and shame and disappointment and disgust, like there's quite a stacking of emotions. And you don't know which of those is going to be useful and relevant, and so it all emerges at the same time. Now, one of the questions that was being begged, let's say, by this discussion was the idea of the relationship between these frames of reference to one another. I'm going to describe that relationship because one of the things that I want to describe to you is how you determine how upset you should be when something anomalous happens. Because it's really hard to figure out, right? So, because 
Well, you see this often, especially if you're unsophisticated in, in dispute settlement with an intimate partner. Every little bump in the relationship is the potential dissolution of the entire relationship. That's actually why people get married, you know, j just so you know. Because this is built into marital vows. I'm not leaving. Ever, no matter what. It's like, okay, well, that definitely puts a boundary around our arguments, right? Because I can't say every time you manifest one of your flaws, which you're likely to do just as often as me, well, enough of this. It's like, that's horrible, man. If your whole life is, well, every time you get out of line, I'm, I'm out of here. It's like, how the hell are you? First of all, you're not going to admit to ever doing anything wrong. Second, you're going to be on your... You're like a, like a scared cat the entire relationship because, well, who knows, it could just come to an end at any moment. It's like, you know, people say, well, if, you're, if the possibility of divorce is open, it makes you free. It's like, yeah, that's what you want. You want to be free, eh? Really? Really? So you can't predict anything. That's what you're after. It's a vow. And it says, look, I know that you're trouble. Me too. So we won't leave, no matter what happens. Well, that's a hell of a vow, but that's why it's a vow, right? That's why you take it in front of a bunch of people. That's why it's supposed to be a sacred act. It's like, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Everything is mutable and changeable at any moment. Well, go ahead. You live, you live your life like that and see what you're like when you're 50. Jesus, it's dismal. Two or three divorces, your family's fragmented. You've got no continuity of narrative. It's, and it's not good for the kids, not by any stretch of the imagination. And so, it's a form of voluntary enslavement, I suppose, but it's also equivalent to the adoption of a responsibility. And there's more to it than that. If you can't run away, then you can solve your problems. Because it might be, okay, well, I'm stuck with you. So how about we fix things? Because the alternative is we're going to be in a boxing match for the next 40 years. That's the alternative. So, and you think you're going to fix problems without something like that hanging over your head? There isn't a chance. You'll just avoid them, because that's what people do. It's really hard to, to solve problems, especially in a relationship. We're having a fight, and I find out that it's, you know, because you're, you were abused by your uncle when you were five or some goddamn thing. You know, it's like, it's very frequent that that sort of thing happens. You, there, there's the partner, your partner is, you know, manifesting some weird anomalous behavior. You just can't make heads or tails of it. It doesn't seem related to what you're doing at all. They don't want to talk about it. And so as soon as you bring it up, they get mad. And then you bring it up again, they even get madder, and they tell you that you're not going to talk about that or they're going to leave. And so maybe you're really, really persistent because you're kind of a son of a bitch, and then they break down and cry, you know? And then they have this horrible memory that comes flooding forward that's completely, you don't know what to do with it, and then you have to sort it out. It's like, you think you're going to do that unless there's a good reason? You have to know, we better sort this out or we're going to be carrying it around for the next 40 years. That maybe is enough motivation so you'll actually try hard to solve a problem. It's a lot easier to say, well, <laughs> sorry, we're not going there. But then, good, you'll have it every day. Every day, every goddamn day for the rest of your life. Anyways, back to this. All right, so, what's the relationship between your frames of reference? Well, we can... We can well, we, let's do it this way. Let's see if I can think of a good, of a good example. Why did you get up this morning? Okay, why? Why did you want to come to class? To... Um... This class? Yes. Okay, so why do you want to come... This is a serious question. Why did you want to come to class? To, uh, to get the knowledge that it's going to be... Uh, that is something I'm going to be tested on. Okay, okay. Is there, is there any reason other than the testing that you came to class? It's okay. You can, I, this is not a trap. I'm, you can say whatever you want. I'm just, it's just, they're, just, they're just straight questions. Um, okay, so let's say no for the time being, or, or not for reasons that you can immediately bring to mind. Okay, why does the test matter? For the degree. Okay, why, does, why do you care about the degree? To get a job. Okay, whose decision was it that you took the degree that you're taking? Mine. Yours, okay. Did your parents have any influence on that? No. No, okay, okay. What job are you after? Psychology. 
psychologist. Clinical? Yes. Clinical psychologist. Why do you want to do that? Again, you don't, I'm going to question you till you run out of answers. You will run out of answers. So if this is the time, that's fine. Why do you want to, why do, you want to do clinical psychology? To help people. To help people. Okay. Okay. Why is that more important to you than making money? Mm, because it helps me interact. How? It sort of makes me happy to see other people get over their problems. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Well, that's pretty good. You, you had lots of answers. So sometimes you can run people out of answers with about three questions. So, all right. So, small action perception nested in larger action perception nested in larger action perception all the way out to well, until you run out of answers, fundamentally, right? So, and that's where, th at the edge where you run out of answers, that's where metaphysics takes over. Because no, you're not in a rational domain anymore. You're in a metaphysical domain at that point. And so you have implicit assumptions that you don't even know about that are working on, on, on the fringes. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, so, so then, we could take a category like, hmm, we'll do a microanalysis the same way. So you're at home and you're uh, tickling the baby. All right, so we'll note first that's not an abstraction, right? There's an actual baby and you're moving your fingers. And so that's not just an abstract conceptualization. It's, it's also where your consciousness ends. You're tickling the baby, but you don't know how you're doing it. You don't know the musculature. You don't know how to manipulate the little organs and everything. You can just do it. So bang, you're out of the perceptual domain at that point. It grounds out in voluntary action. All right, so you're tickling the baby. What are you doing when you're tickling the baby? Well, you're making the baby laugh. Okay, that's one way. You're playing with the baby. Okay, so fine. That's a subset of the activity play with baby. And you can play peekaboo with the baby, you can tickle the baby, you can clean the baby. Those, and all of that can be part of playing. And you might say, well, what are you doing when you're playing with a baby? And you'd say, well, I'm taking care of my family. And fine, and then you think, well, what, what are you doing when you're taking care of your family? And you might say, well, I'm being a good parent. And then you might say, well, what am I doing when I'm being a good parent? You might say, well, I'm being a good person. And then you could say, well, why should you be a good person? But we won't go any farther than that. It's sort of, because you can see that that's sort of the, in some sense, that's an ultimate level of abstraction. Okay, so you could, what do you do? They, someone comes up to you and you're tickling the baby and you say, well, I'm being a good person. They ask, what are you doing? I'm being a good person. It's like, it's a bit dis disjointed. It isn't what the person would expect as an answer. They'd expect something more local, but it's still true. And so what's interesting is that when you're doing something that's, well, well, I would say worthwhile. That's probably the right way of thinking about it. You're doing a whole bunch of things simultaneously. And you're not really aware of all those things, but you are in some sense, you know, because if the person, someone might come along and say, well, what kind of idiot tickles a baby like that? It's like, well, what have they said? Well, they've kind of nailed you here down on the micro tickle level, but they're sort of also taking a pretty good crack at this high level system as well. Now, and that's a problem. So let's say, well, good parent is a subset of being a good person, but there's all sorts of other, maybe you have to be a good partner. Maybe you have to be a good daughter. Maybe you have to be a good niece, you know? There, your, your, your ability to function as a good person is composed of a very large number of hierarchically nested subsystems. And so when the person goes, only an idiot would tickle the baby like that, and they go after that, you might think, well, how upset you should, should you get? And the answer is, well, how valid do you think their complaint is? So let's say maybe only an idiot would tickle a baby like that, and you happen to be that idiot. And so, well, maybe you're not a good person, and so what does that mean? It means that the map that consists of all these nested subsystems has now become unreliable. And so how upset are you going to get about that? Well, you know, maybe you had a bad day at work, and you're kind of hypoglycemic, and you had too much to drink the night before, and so someone says, you know, that's not how you tickle a baby, you idiot, and you cry. Well, why? Well, it's a pretty high-level blow. And so, it's the sort of thing you want, to do if, you want to do if you want to hurt someone. It's not a good way to teach someone. Because you teach them down at the smallest possible level, the micro... No, no, you don't tickle a baby like that. You tickle a baby like this. And you're doing a good job. 
on everything else But if you're going to tickle a baby, this is how you go about it And the person thinks, well, you know, I'm doing a fairly good job But I've got this little thing I have to work on and maybe I can manage it And so that works and that, that works, and you can have some sympathy for the person at the same time Because you might say, well, I used to tickle babies like an idiot too, but, you know, it's, it's fixable And most of you is okay And that's a nice thing to do when you're arguing with someone You say, look, 